Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Phoenix Children's Grand Rounds, virtual style. Wherever you're joining us this morning, whether from your home or office or, or anywhere, we're very, very glad that you can be with us. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Shorsay Bezeha. Dr. Bezeha is joining us this morning from Cincinnati, Ohio, where he is the director of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, as well as the William and Rebecca Balistrieri Endowed Chair in Pediatric Hepatology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Dr. Bezeha completed medical school in his native home, Natal, Brazil. He then moved to Tucson, Arizona, and did his pediatric residency at the U of A, and then moved on to Cincinnati, Ohio, where he did his fellowship in pediatric gastroenterology at Cincinnati Children's. Dr. Bezeha has had an incredibly accomplished clinical and research career. He has co-authored over 150 peer-reviewed publications, invited papers, and book chapters. The title of his talk this morning is Advancing the Care of Children with Biliary Atresia by Applied Research. As always, uh, we hope to have a time of uh, Q&A and interaction at the end, and you are encouraged to submit uh, questions or comments through the chat function, and we'll read that uh, uh, and ask uh, Dr. Bezeha at the end of the talk. We're glad you could join us, and Dr. Bezeha, we're very, very glad you could be with us this morning. Thank you, Micah, and a good morning, Phoenix uh, Children's Hospital. It is for me a real privilege and an honor to give Grand Rounds uh, today. Uh, like you, I wish that I would be there to uh, share the time, look at you, get to meet you, and share some excitement about the field of pediatrics and as a physician scientist to share some thoughts on how science can be used to improve care. I know of uh, your hospital and I know how you deliver state-of-the-art care for the children of Arizona. Your leadership is important. As a hospital and in the community, you demonstrate your breadth and depth in specialty care in pediatrics. As I met with your institutional leaders, I learned that you are points of pride for Phoenix Children's Hospital without any question. I also learned about the recent partnership with the University of Arizona that actually is uh, uh, much longer than, re than, than recent, as you uh, house the Department of Child Health and you have served as an outstanding environment for pediatric training. Without any question, uh, you are committed to excellence and you want to be a player in designing the future of pediatrics. One of the strategies is to integrate research and innovation into clinical care, what you do every day to improve the lives of your patients. I share with you this graph in which uh, often we identify a problem at the bedside and go to the laboratory to understand the biological basis of that problem. Uh, use basic science tools to understand the mechanisms of disease generate new potential for therapeutics and uh, develop clinical trials, demonstrate and study the outcome of that intervention and how to best deliver the new uh, therapeutic. So today I will use the model of biliary atresia to see how we begin at the bedside and then do some of this uh, pathway uh, road mapping uh, with you. In preparing for this grand rounds, I, would, I decided to focus the presentation on reviewing the clinical presentation of biliary atresia with you, but then focus on a published, published studies that show how we have uh, prom, uh, identified strategies to advance diagnostics like the use of matrix metalloproteinase 7 as a biomarker of disease, and our ongoing studies to advance 
our knowledge on pathogenesis of disease and therefore understand better the mechanisms of tissue injury. So let me start with uh, what is biliary atresia. It's indeed the most common cause of end stage liver disease in children that always begins in the first two to three months of age. Never six months, never one year, always early, soon after birth. The disease derives from uh, inflammation and fibrosis of the bile ducts that lead to a loss of the lumen of extrahepatic bile duct, therefore disrupting the bile flow from the liver to the intestine. This is a severe disease and liver transplantation is the only hope for long-term survival. And it does improve survival to more than 85% of the transplanted patients after 10 years from transplantation. Now, very little I was known about what caused biliary attrition in the past, but now we know more. I think we are living in the future because we have a greater knowledge of the disease and especially as we, look, as we look forward, we have several tools that will enable uh, discoveries. So in this drawing, on your left, you have the liver of a healthy baby and painted in green, in green is the anatomic site of disease, the extrahepatic biliary system, and here's a gallbladder. On the right, we have the same anatomical a geography that is now completely obstructed uh, from within to outside the liver. If we do a cross section of the extrahepatic bile duct, you see that where you used to have a lumen, there is a concentric deposition of a matrix proteins that blocks the bile, drug, bile duct and disrupts bile flow, as I mentioned. Uh, so uh, first, uh, let's start in the clinic using history and physical examination and laboratory tests to make the diagnosis of biliary attrition. Let's start with uh, sharing a patient with you, an eight-week-old infant with jaundice, pale stools that was seen by a pediatrician in a well baby visit. There was a history of transient neonatal jaundice the infant was being breastfed, had good growth, did appear jaundice, and had mild hepatosplenomegaly. The pediatrician obtained laboratory studies which showed mild increase in liver enzymes, ALT of 124, AS, uh, AST 124, ALT 157. The direct billy was high at 3.8, and so was the GGT. This patient underwent a liver biopsy, and you can see here the portal tract, the arrows pointing to the uh, proliferation of intrahepatic bile duct that is very typical of biliary atresia. In this setting of a background that shows fairly uh, unremarkable hepatocytes on both sides. Uh, he, this patient needs to go to a intraoperative inter cholangiogram on the left we have the surgeon uh, inserting a catheter into the gallbladder of a, a baby that did not have biliary atresia. This is not the patient that I showed you. As the surgeon inserts contrast, you can see that the gallbladder fills the cystic duct, goes up into the uh, liver through the uh, common bile duct, uh, the hepatic duct, and then the common bile duct quickly shows that it's patent, draining the um, contrast filling the intestinal loop. Our patient, however, uh, the surgeon also inserted the, uh, the catheter into a rudimentary gallbladder, pushed the contrast, or actually the contrast uh, extravasated, delineating the edge of the liver because it was completely obstructed and you did not see the extrahepatic bile duct or the intestinal loop that would fill down here. So this baby had biliary atresia. Once the diagnosis is made, uh, the patient undergoes surgery. So well, how do these patients present? There is always a clinical triad of jaundice, acolic stools, and variable levels of hepatosplenomegaly. 
is babies can also have symptoms due to complication of chronic cholestasis, such as vitamin K deficiency presenting as bruising or with hematoma. You can also have symptoms and signs that derive from complication of the involvement of non-hepatic systems, such as those babies that have a cardiac a defect that can present with cyanosis or vomiting because of intestinal malrotation. Miliana atresia comes in two different clinical forms. There's this non-syndromic form that is the most common. Babies have normal growth, have the hepatobiliary symptoms that I mentioned above. In about 10 to 20% of them, they have a syndromic form, which in addition to the clinical triad, they have laterality defects, splenic malformation, and as I said, some uh, gastrointestinal and cardiovascular abnormalities. There is a, a, an anatomic variant called the cystic variant that is often detected prenatally by ultrasound of the uh, pregnant mother. And uh, this, these patients may uh, also have other non-hepatic malformations similar to syndromic form. So this is a surgical Morning. field. Can I have a medium-sized caramel macchiato with soy? So this is an uh, interoperative uh, field showing polysplenia. And this is the liver on the top. Uh, this is uh, uh, also another interoperative uh, view showing the liver on top, the hands of the surgeon, a rudimentary contracted gallbladder. But then this patient had this cystic uh, bulging uh, in this site. The surgeon put the catheter into that rudimentary gallbladder, pushed some contrast that fills the cyst, but it never filled the intestinal loop, which would be down here. So when they make the diagnosis of biliary atresia, the surgeon removes the uh, remnant of the biliary, disease biliary uh, system, and then anastomoses a loop of uh, jejunum into the hyalur plate, promoting any existing uh, bile duct to drain directly into the intestinal lumen in a surgery designed by Professor Kasai from Japan. After Kasai procedure, you provide nutritional support, vitamin A, D, and K, the fat soluble vitamins. You may or may not use also deoxycholic acid to promote uh, cholerasis. And there is a question about the use of corticosteroids to aid recovery as well as the use of antibiotics. If the patient does not undergo hep uh, hepatoporentrostomy or the CASI procedure, there is a uniform progression to liver transplantation. And even those that have the CASI procedure have progression of disease, developing episodes of cholangitis. They have progressive fibrosis to develop cirrhosis and complications of hypertension, gastrointestinal bleeding, ascites, and malnutrition. Of course, one uh, finding has been present throughout the history of biliary atresia, which is the younger the patient, the better the outcome. So it's important that we have ways to make the diagnosis early on. And I will present uh, uh, to you studies that we have performed answering two questions. Can we identify biomarkers of biliary atresia that can perhaps be used to make a timely diagnosis of the disease so that the patients can undergo the CASI procedure? And can we learn more about the mechanisms of disease so that we can design new treatments? So how can we uh, develop by markers that will reliably predict the diagnosis. And this is a, a study, a couple of studies that we performed using human tissues. Uh, giving the credit first to Dr. Um, Chatmani. She is a pediatric hepatologist who spent three years in our laboratory. And in her study, she obtained uh, serum samples from babies with biliary atresia and Neonatal cholestasis is not secondary to biliary atresia, that also matched by age, and quantified the protein of about, uh, quantified about 1,100 proteins in the serum of these babies. After she did the study, 
he did another cohort, which we call validation cohort number one, to see if we could reproduce the findings, and then validation cohort number two. And this, uh, to obtain the serum, we propose an ancillary study to the NIDDK funded children consortium. Um, among the over 1,100 proteins, two together, MMP7 and ENPP7, had a high level of sensitivity and specificity to differentiate biliary atresia from non-biliary atresia H-match disease controls with an area under the curve of 0 0.99. Notably, when she looked at the area under the curve for the individual proteins, she saw that most of the accuracy derived from MMP7, which was better than what we use currently, which is GGT. And if she combined GGT with MMP7, she saw uh, that the, A, the end under the curve for accuracy increased to 0.98, which is almost perfect. She then did the same studies now uh, in a validation cohort. And as you can see here, there is a drop in the AUC in every one of these uh, uh, graphs uh, from 0.99 to 0.9 but all of it was due to MMP7. And look, that GGT also dropped to 0.89. When you combine MMP7 with the currently available biochemical marker GGT, you had an accuracy of 0.94. Of course, we're also interested in uh, discovery new therapeutics or new therapeutic targets. So we used, uh, she used uh, a mouse model that I will tell you in a, in a little bit uh, to treat the mouse model of biliary atresia with a placebo vehicle control, a non-specific protease, anti-protease, and then you have uh, a biochemical inhibitor of matrix, matrix metalloproteinases, so a PEN MMP inhibitor, or use antibody to specifically deplete the mouse of MMP7. And what she saw was that if you get a, if you use the vehicle or the anti, a non-specific anti-protease, you have complete obstruction of the extra hepatic bile duct in this longitudinal uh, section. Whereas if you use a biochemical inhibitor of MMPs or the antibody to MMP7, you had the intact epithelium of the extra hepatic bile duct with the patent lumen in both uh, settings. She also quantified uh, this and the graph shown below. And here you look at the number of mice that had liver uh, injury. So you can see that the vehicle or the non-specific inhibitor, there was severe, moderate and severe uh, injury to the liver, but very little in, uh, 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 in uh, the anti-MMP7 inhibitor, as well as the antibody depletion. When she quantified the number of extra hepatics bile ducts that were obstructed, she saw that all of them were obstructed in, in both controls, but most of them became patent when MMP7 was uh, inhibited, suggesting that this may be a therapeutic target to improve the outcome of uh, these patients. But we, wanna, we were particularly curious about the high AUC, and we wanted to see if we could validate the high concentration of MMP7 to diagnose biliary atresia in an independent cohort. And, to the, and for that, uh, I introduce you to Yang Li, who is a pediatric surgeon in my laboratory from Wuhan, China. And she obtained 200 subjects. Uh, all of them were uh, H-meshed, half biliary atresia and non-biliary atresia in the neurocholestasis for the cholestasis group. And then the normal controls that were age matched and also those that were greater than six months of age. Like the first study, we saw that using ELISA to precisely quantify the concentration of MMP7 in the serum, it was uniformly high in patients with biliary atresia compared to those disease controls. And uh, showing here the normals that are always below the cutoff 
indeed in a cutoff of uh, 58, 52.8 nanograms per ml, MMP7 concentration in the serum is 98.7% sensitive and 95% specific with a phenomenal area of the curve uh, of MMP7 compared to the clinical standard uh, uh, GGT in this cohort. So today, we can uh, potentially use uh, MMP7 uh, as a biomarker of biliary atresia to improve diagnostics. Uh, it's an essay that can be done easily. We're beginning to do this here and offer in clinical practice. So perhaps we can evolve in which we use a diagnostic algorithm today when we see a patient with conjugated hypobilirubinemia, we do a series of laboratory tests that can take some time to come back in addition to ultrasound, high day scan, and other modalities to look at the extra hepatic biliary system to finally do a liver biopsy and cholangiogram. Based on these studies, one can conceive a, a future in which you can simplify and revise the, the uh, diagnostic algorithm to include MMP7 early on and perhaps bypass a high MMP7 and go directly into cholangiogram. Some of these studies are, being, uh, are undergoing prospective validation. Yes, it's Cincinnati Children's. So let's now uh, go to the later portion of the presentation in which I will share with you how we use bench modeling to understand the disease, uh, cause a disease pathogenesis and begin to think about designing treatments. Uh, I will share with you in one diagram uh, the summary of a NIH-funded uh, uh, meeting at the uh, NIH in which we looked at the clinical research challenges for the 21st century for biliary atresia. We met in 2017 and published in 2018. And the summary of the meeting uh, is highlighted uh, here. Uh, this is birth of the infant, development of biliary atresia and CASI. We know that there are specific genes that can have been associated with biliary atresia, but in a very small number of patients. Uh, there is evidence that, uh, that viruses and toxins can induce injury to the biliary system either prior to birth or after birth. There is also some recent evidence that it appears to be some developmental susceptibility to biliary atresia, as shown with a decrease in glycocalyx in the cholangial sites, decreased cell cell junctions, and perhaps an imbalanced uh, oxidative uh, redox status of these babies. Regardless of the cause and the developmental susceptibility, there is a brisk inflammatory driven injury to the extrahepatic biliary system that progresses to develop fibrosis and then cirrhosis in these babies. We spent 10 to 15 years studying the mechanisms of inflammation and fibrosis, which I summarized in, the, uh, in, in a cartoon that was uh, able to be developed because of studies in mice. We obtained generated hypotheses using a gene expression and cell analysis in the liver biopsies of babies used mice to develop mechanistic experiments, generate a new hypothesis that validated back in patients. In this animal model, the administration of rotavirus soon after birth leads to development of pale A. colex tools as shown here in this, in this uh, baby mouse. Uh, just like what we see in humans, that is followed by a complete obliteration of the lumen of extra hepatic bile duct by inflammatory cell. And shown here on this side, a patent uh, blood vessel. Using this mouse model, we would induce uh, injury to cholangial sites by a virus and show that neutrophils and macrophages secrete into leukin-8 that drives chemotaxis of other inflammatory cells, including PDC, NK cells, and CD8 T cells. We were able to genetically and biochemically either remove each one of these cells or each one of these molecules. And if we do, you completely block the injury of the epithelial breach. 
if we do not block, it is for the amplification and production of TNF alpha, and finally complete injury and obstruction of the extrahepatic biliary system. And this year we identified that the hepatic erythropoiesis that we see in babies with biliary atresia uh, are actually regulators of the immune response following an injury to extrahepatic bile ducts. So despite this prominent role of inflammatory changes in pathogenesis of experimental biliary atresia, when we try to use steroids as a single treatment after CASI to all babies with biliary atresia, we did not see that it is effective for all patients. So the, we still have the question, what causes biliary atresia? And I'll share with you unpublished studies that address the following question. Does the mother influence the susceptibility of the neonates to biliary atresia? This is study, uh, this studies were performed by JG, uh, PhD in our laboratory, and you, you met earlier a young Lee. First, JG uh, uh, fed uh, or treated the mice with Bactrim, and he saw the Bactrim uh, treatment would improve the outcome of the mice. And he did 16S uh, sequencing to, uh, to study the population of the microbiome of the mice that were resistant to biliary atresia because they were treated by Bactrim. And he saw an enrichment in pink of actinobacteria and corinobacteriaceae in uh, those mice. This is a cladogram, and the way that one sees a cladogram is from within, going up, looking at the phylum, class, order, family, genus, and the species of the bacteria. And when you have representation at different levels, you, you see a uh, true enrichment of the bacteria in this mouse model. Interestingly enough, this bacteria produce butyrate. So JG and Young Lee asked the question, what happens if I feed others during pregnancy butyrate and then inject RRV or rotavirus to the neonate where they develop experimental biliary atresia. And what they found was that treating butyrate makes the, to the mothers makes the pups resistant to biliary atresia. Uh, they have improved survival. They have no obstruction of the actual hepatic bowel duct and much uh, lesser degree of liver inflammation. Interestingly enough, if they fed butyrate directly into the pups, they also observed a protected phenotype. However, when they tried to do mechanistic studies at the cellular level and incubated butyrate with these inflammatory cells, butyrate was unable to directly inhibit this uh, inflammatory destruction of the extrahepatic bowel duct and the liver. Therefore, they proceeded with the experiments and uh, did not challenge the mice with rotavirus. Instead, obtained their, fe their feces, obtained the supernatant, and then incubated the supernatant with activated lymphocytes. And there was no suppression of the hepatic activated mononuclear cells. But if the uh, supernatant came from, mother, from babies whose mothers were fed butyrate, they suppressed the hepatic mononuclear cells. So next, we did metabolomics in these fecal supernatants, and I share here the results with you. A quantification of the metabolites uh, in those uh, fecal supernatant show a high abundance of glutamate and hypoxanthine and a high p-value, but also other metabolites that are also significant, but not the highest. And these metabolites include uh, three hydroxybutyrate. So there is butyrate that is enriched in the fecal supernatant, and much higher for glutamate and glutamine. So they said, could it be that these uh, metabolites are coming from the uh, intestinal <clears throat> microbiome? So uh, the, uh, our, our investigators then asked, could it be that these metabolites are coming from uh, the uh, intestinal microbiota. And the first thing they did was they studied the supernatants that came from butyrate-fed mothers. 
uh, that whose mice were resistant or susceptible. So if they had biliary atresia, you have the light green and resistant that receive butyrate are in the darker green. And you can see there is enrichment for bacterioidetes and the clostridia in these uh, in the microbiome of uh, these uh, mice. Then we actually collaborated with another center and obtained over 100 sample, stool samples from babies with biliary atresia. And they had the same, in this case, we did metagenomic uh, sequencing uh, for the human uh, stool samples. And we found that like what we saw in the experimental model, there is enrichment for bacterial that is in normal control, not in biliary atresia, as well as clostridia. So babies that develop the disease lost clostridia and bacterioidetes, like what we saw in the mice that became sick. And they also lost bacterioidetes and clostridia. Since we did not have stools to look at the metabolites in humans, we use the microbial signature to predict where or to look at which metabolic pathways is enriched in humans. In blue, I show you the statistically significant pathways that contain glutamine and glutamate, and only one ha had hypoxanthine. So we did the logical experiment, which was to go back to the neonates whose mother had no treatment with butyrate infected them with rotavirus, and then treated them with inosine, which is hypoxanthine uh, derivative. And you can see that treating with inosine did not change the course of jaundice, and all mice died like the ones that received control. However, if we gave the mice glutamine, there was a, decrease, a lower percentage of the mice that developed jaundice, and most of them survived. And if we gave both of them, we had again survival of the mice that received glutamine plus inosine. So glutamine appears to be protective uh, for this, uh, against biliary atresia. And at the mechanistic level, if we can get activated hepatic mononuclear cells and incubate with cholangiocyte in an assay called cholangiocyte lysis assay, if you increase the concentration of glutamine, NK cells are unable to kill, uh, to kill cholangiocytes. So we propose a model in which the mother indeed can influence the susceptibility of uh, infants uh, to biliary atresia, establish, establishing thus a mat-gut-liver interaction. Feeding the pregnant mother of the short-chain fatty acid butyrate changes the mother's microbiome the mother transfers the microbiome to its offspring that produces butyrate. In addition, that microbiome within the intestinal lumen produces glutamine, which protects cholangiocytes from the activated action of NK cells, thus maintaining intact biliary epithelium. To end my presentation, I will share with you recent exciting set of experiments done uh, with, with Young Lee with a gene expression analysis, and then uh, Shuria, Jiao Feng, and Hiro, Hiroaki, uh, investigators that are doing this uh, tissue engineering work to, bed, to build the bile duct and study uh, biliary atresia in humans. So you are familiar with this model that I presented to you earlier. And now I introduce to you uh, biliary organoids that we derive from liver biopsies of babies with biliary atresia. In this first slide, we actually uh, obtained a small fragment of uh, a liver, a normal liver transplant donor, which uh, was uh, part of it was used for a smaller child, and the other half we were able to get for, for research. And we, uh, in this essay, we have pieces of the liver biopsy here. And then you can see here beginning this small uh, structure that began to grow in a higher magnification, grew by day six, 
grew further by day 15, and then we pass them. So these spheroids can be generated from each one of these uh, circles, squares, or triangles represent a different subject. So we were able to generate these spheroids from uh, liver biopsies of normal donors, biliary atresia, and disease controls. But note that although all of the normals we can cryopreserve and establish spheroid lineage, this is not true for all the patients with biliary atresia or, disease or other diseases. Now, what do they look like? These spheroids that grew from the human liver biopsies have this epithelial lining that look like cholangial sites. They have a polar polarized nucleus in the lumen of the spheroid from now on calling it cholangiocyte organoid. The same is seen in disease control with a polarized, polarized uh, cells forming this epithelium and the appearance before the section. They also look alike before your section, but in biliary atresia, the cell appears to be less polarized and with a much smaller uh, cytoplasm to nucleus uh, ratio. Further looking at polarity of the cells, we found that in the normals you have F actin that stains the, the top of the cell facing the lumen of the organoid. Beta actin that is basal lateral, basal lateral uh, staining, and then you merge, and you can see where the nucleus resides. The same organization exists in disease controls. But in biliary atresia, you can see the F actin goes down to the basal portion, and some of the beta actin goes very strong to the basal lateral and apical portion, showing that there is a defect in polarity in human uh, biopsies from babies with biliary atresia. We then did a staining uh, for the cilium, which shows here in green did confocal microscopy and a 3D reconstruction. You can see here the cholangial site with the cilium pointing towards the middle or the center of the organoid. You can see them, quantify, and look at their organization towards the middle of the spheroid in a polarized fashion. When we did the same, now, for a, a, from a biliary atresia organoid, you can see that you do see the cilium. This is normal liver organoid. Let me go to the next. This is biliary atresia organoid. You do see ciliated cells, but look that the cilium points outside the cell on the top here. If you follow the green color, this is the cilium. There are fewer ciliated cells, so there's a defect in the number, and then you see that the cilium actually point outside. You can follow that, pointing outside. So there is indeed defect in uh, polarization of uh, these organoids. On the left here, I'll show you how these organoids, we uh, filmed them for five days, and then show here how they grow uh, forming this uh, center, the secrete, anterior to the center, and they grow into very healthy organoids from a normal liver. In contrast, in biliary atresia, they also grow. You can see here that the cells begin to organize. But then you see that they grow, and then something happens. They have these contractions. So as they produce the liquid that fills the organoids, it looks like it breaks the epithelium and they contract until they have enough cells and they grow. So actually we can quantify these contractions and show statistical significance in biliary atresia compared to control. And to do it in a more quantifiable fashion, we incubated these organoids from normal biliary atresia and disease control with rhodamine 123. And after two hours, there is an increased uptake of rhodamine that we put in outside the organoid into the organoid compared to a much lower uptake in normal in disease control. 
if we block the uptake with verapamil, there is some blockage of the amount of uptake of R123 in biliary atresia, but not as much baseline that you can see with normal disease control. And you can quantify that. Much higher biliary atresia compared to normal disease control. In verapamil, there was a drop in the uptake, but not, uh, they're not normalized to the levels that we, we see in normal disease controls, demonstrating there is an increase in, in uh, epithelial permeability. So in summary, we have evidence of halted epithelial development as the basis for pathogenesis of human biliary atresia. We have shown that these cholangiocyte organoids can be derived from livers. They have a different expression panel of developmental markers that shows a delayed, delayed development in biliary atresia. There's a defect in cell polarity and adhesion. The epithelial lining has increased in cell permeability. But then most interestingly, we actually were able to use exogenous factor to partially correct these defects in cell polarity and decrease the permeability of the epithelium. So we are focusing on these factors to see if we can actually have any a translational potential for some of uh, these growth factors. So I want to uh, end by thanking uh, individual members uh, of my laboratory. Uh, first, Dr. Pranav Shiva Kumar, who directs the technology uh, and training in the laboratory. He's associate professor of pediatrics. Rina Muria, a very talented laboratory supervisor and then a group of phenomenally skilled uh, trainees uh, that are today in my laboratory. And I want to call your attention to Julie Osborne, who did her residency training at Phoenix Children's Hospital and now is a pediatric GI fellow at Cincinnati Children, and Sindhu Panduraji. Sindhu is a graduate of the University of Arizona Phoenix, did her residency at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and is now a pediatric fellow here at Society Children. And to end, I want to acknowledge the help and funding from the uh, NIDDK uh, and the Children Network, as well as support from Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, with that, I end, and I'll be glad to uh, uh, answer questions that you might have. Dr. Bezeha, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. We wish we were with you in person so we could give you a proper round of applause, uh, but uh, we will do that from uh, afar. I have with me uh, Dr. Ashish Patel, who is our GI chief here at Phoenix Children's, and uh, he's gonna have some questions and moderate our Q&A. Please do continue to use the chat function um, as we, uh, we start our Q&A. Dr. Bezeha, thank you. That was uh, excellent and enjoyed listening to you and seeing you from afar and hopefully we can see you in person soon. I had a couple of questions and then I'll read some of the chat questions as well. Um, in the mouse models that you talked about, which, you know, related back to the halting of the epithelial development, are you able to sort of create the different subtypes of BA that we see in humans, you know, the, the isolated BA versus uh, polysplenia or malrotation, the, the different subtypes. Do you see those different subtypes in the mouse models and, and how are they, how do they relate to this concept of uh, uh, halting of epithelial development that you talked about? It's a great question. So the mouse, uh, there is no subphenotype in the mouse model. What we uh, see in the mouse is that that experimental system is great in phenocopying that inflammatory component of the extrahepatic biliary injury, but not a very good mouse model to study the fibrosis or the syndromic and non-syndromic form of biliary atresia. In contrast, this new tool of uh, liver-derived biliary organoids, we see this defect in development at the cellular level both in the syndromic and the non-syndromic form. So it appears that there is a unifying defect in epithelial development. And on top of that, those that have the genetic 
uh, abnormalities may have the syndromic component, the 10, 20% of that subset of population. Uh, great, thank you. One of the questions from the uh, chat group, do you see, do you foresee the day when the biomarkers would be added to a newborn screen? And if so, so we prevent biliary atresia from developing? It's great, it's a great question. And indeed, uh, we are developing some uh, GCMS strategies to see if we can actually detect MMP7 uh, in the dry blood, that, right? But actually, we may be able to use MMP7 in a slightly different way until that technology is made available. First, we know today that every patient with biliary atresia in three large case series, uh, regardless of the time of diagnosis, they all had increase in direct bilirubin at the time of diagnosis. So we can detect the direct hypobilirubinemia at, at the time of birth. But it takes a few uh, weeks until the disease is fully developed. So perhaps in babies that have increased levels of direct bilirubin at birth, they can then be screened for the usual serum concentration of MMP7. And if MMP7 is elevated, that patient may be then followed for potential development of biliary atresia. And most importantly, perhaps being that early on, we may be able to use some of these preclinical drugs to stop the inflammation from progressing and developing the uh, ob uh, obstruction of the extrahepatic bile duct. That would be ideal to actually prevent the obstruction and block the disease before full development of the clinical phenotype. Yeah, that, that would be incredible. One of the surgeons followed up, um, an incredible body of research. How do we start testing for BA? Is the lab test available now? So can you talk a little bit about that accessibility to the MFB7? So yes, the, the, the test is actually a clear, is, is being done in a clear and CAP approved. We are using the 52.8 nanograms per ml. Uh, it's done three times a week. But uh, we are also working with the, so uh, when we get the result, we are actually contacting the pediatric gastroenterologist or surgeon and we are finding that the, uh, the bench testing, if you will, the clinical testing, we don't have an accuracy of 95, 98, 99% as we saw. It's becoming it's about to 92, 93%. And I think a lot of this appears to be due to the fact that the cutoff concentration that we identified for the population in China is different from the US population. So we have an ancillary study of the children network that we are doing just that. It's getting 200 babies with biliary atresia, 200 with non-biliary atresia and neurocholestasis, all age matched to develop a cutoff level. So then the test can be widely available through the whole nation. You can order it now. It's a clear, clear and cap approved. We are doing it. We are using it to do improve our diagnostic algorithm. But I think a much better discri discriminatory power of MMP7 will be done uh, after we do this, va this validation in the U.S. population. The, uh, one, one of the things that uh, often is in the discussion when we are uh, evaluating these babies for the first time is uh, the necessity for a HIDA scan. So what, what is, uh, what is uh, Cincinnati's approach to that? Do, do all patients get a HIDA scan or um, uh, do some of them go along that algorithm that you showed with um, labs, uh, ultrasound, and then potentially straight to IOC or liver biopsy? So the practice here is a little different now because we, we, uh, we have been studying MMP7 here for three years. So now we, we do alpha-1, we do an ultrasound to make sure there's not a major anatomic uh, cholecystal cyst or something like that. MMP7, liver biopsy, cholangiogram. Very fast. We don't do high-day scan. What we want is to see if we can bypass 
the liver biopsy. Costly, expose the babies to additional uh, testing, but I think at this time, uh, we need more precision and we're waiting for those blood tests or blood samples to do the uh, final normative uh, uh, algorithm. Great, I think I'll ask, oops, so we've got one question here in the audience. Uh, hi, Dr. Wichita, my name's Anthony. I have two questions for you. Um, one is in your animal model uh, using the rotavirus to induce biliary atresia. Have you tried creating organoids from those? And is that uh, same phenotype recapitulated? Uh, yes, we have. It's very easy. It's very easy to do organoid. And we have even done organoid just from the cystic duct, the gallbladder, the common blood duct to see if there is a regional uh, biological difference between the cholangial sites. Why is it the biliary atresia attacks? just the extrahepatobiliary system. Why does it attack the pancreas? It's full of ducts as well. So we can do it. Uh, it mimics the disease. But I think what is, we're very excited about is that now we have a human tissue that we can do personalizing studies and understand the disease in humans. I guess just my question was, is, is that animal model really kind of representative of what's happening in humans? Um, so do you see the same polarization that you see in the human organoids that we do? So after we injure the um, the mouse, if we so after we treat the mice, challenge the mice with RV, the uh, injured cells do not lose the uh, cell polarity and cell adhesion. They actually behave just like a disease tissue organoid, which again shows that the mouse uh, injury is artificial. If I, if I can speculate a little bit, the, I think that the humans that develop biliary atresia have a how to develop an epithelium lining of the bile duct. That makes it susceptible to common virus infection. This is why one population may have real virus in a group of patients with biliary atresia. Others will have rotavirus. Others will have a different type of virus and even CMV. So we know that the virus can cause the injury, but we can also recover from the injury, except those human beings that have the defect in polarization. This is how I tr I'm trying to understand and reconcile this information into one a working model system. We are actually uh, developing not just the diagnostic, a new diagnostic algorithm, but a new protocol to treat biliary atresias after CASI differently, depending on a series of factors. And we began this prospective uh, use of a new protocol, and for the past uh, 14 consecutive babies with biliary atresia, only one CASI failed. All the others led to uh, biliary drainage and the babies are not jaundiced. Still have the progressive fibrosis, but had successful CASI. That's really remarkable. Um, you know, it's not Connection between the microbiome and, and expression of urate, as well as then connecting that to the MMT7 expression. Is there a connection between those? So, uh, um, that's a great question. I never tried to put it together like that. Uh, at this time, we don't have uh, a, uh, a relationship. MMP7 is an intra intracellular protein, and at least in biliary atresia, it serves as a, as a, a sensing signal, a, sense, a sentinel. If there is cell injury, MMP7 is released, goes up in the circulation. This model of MMP7 serving as a sensing signal is also true for breast cancer and MMP7. So for us, uh, butyrate and glutamine protects collagen sites against injury. If there is injury, MMP7 is released. 
and we detect. But I'm not sure how they, the molecules relate themselves, at least not at this phase of our studies. Just as a follow-up question, I, I thought you demonstrated that antibodies against MMP7 can actually prevent that epithelial injury. If it's just a, if it's just a sensor or marker for injury, it seems like it's somehow mechanistically implicated in the injury. It's a great observation, and you're absolutely right. We probably have five or six other inflammatory signals that we have shown experimentally that it blocks biliary atresia. And why not use it in humans? And I think there are several groups that are, that are trying to do just that. It's a very slowly, a much slower process to see which one of those molecules can actually come into a clinical use, including MMP7 inhibitors. So that's a great question. Dr. Bezeha, thank you again for such an outstanding presentation. Uh, we again apologize to you and to our attendees for the Zoom issues. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us, and uh, we wish you uh, best of luck and uh, a great day. It has been my pleasure. Stay healthy, safe, and sane. Take care. <laughs>